The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt them back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to episode 58 of Some Assembly Required, your weekly adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers! This week, we are going to be taking a look at Avengers number 54, and deliver us from the Masters of Evil. This week's issue is written by Roy Thomas, pencils by John Basima, inks by George Tuska, letters by Art Simic, and it comes to us in July of 1968. Real quick before we get into things, uh, I do want to apologize for the last couple of weeks and the late episode and then the missed episode. It's been a, a little bit of a crazy couple weeks and uh, then I got sick, as you may or may not be able to tell from my voice right now, just getting over a head cold. So I didn't want to record something while I was sniffling and coughing all the time. So please forgive me and we will get back into this. Starting off with our cover, let's be honest, this is a classic Avengers cover, and it's a classic for a couple of reasons. First off, we as the readers in 2018 know that this is the introduction of a classic Avengers villain, Ultron. So it's an image and an issue that has been kind of burned into our cultural minds. But in general, I think it's a well done cover. It portrays a great sense of drama and menace. I love the Black Knight breaking through the window, and there's a level of uncertainty as to whether or not he's going to be with or against the Avengers. I also think the black background here adds to that sense of dread and mystery. You don't exactly know what's going on behind the Masters of Evil other than the Black Knight is smashing through the window. My only real complaint with this cover is that you don't easily see Wasp. If you take a really close look at the jar that Claw is holding, you can see a figure that appears to be Wasp and based on the story that makes sense. But you know, you've got three male Avengers dominating the front of the cover. I would really like to see Wasp also there with them. I think it would have been nice. Moving on to our opening splash page, the over-the-top meta commentary on this page is just extremely excellent. So the Avengers here are putting together new security systems because they realize that with all the villains that have broken into the house lately, as Hawkeye puts it, the place is starting to look like an open house. And of course, Wasp agrees with him and as do the rest of the Avengers. So Goliath and Black Panther are working on a system that whenever someone crosses into this dark light, as they called it, then these mechanical arms would come down and grab them and hold them in place. And in theory, it's a pretty good means of at least apprehending anyone trying to break in, if not really deterrence. So I love this page because, one, I always enjoy watching the Avengers improve their technology and trying to make themselves better. You know, it's one of those things, a true master is always constantly working at their craft. And so to see the Avengers periodically working on improving anything they can to make them better heroes or to protect themselves better, to me demonstrates that desire to be real masters of the superheroic arts, if you will. The other thing that's done really well on this page is the black light effect, with the effect basically splitting Black Panther. It's almost like an x-ray, but it's not because you don't see through him, but it's got that same x-ray kind of look and feel to it and the dark light portion and I think it's a really cool effect so I, I particularly enjoy that and finally once again we get another new wasp costume this one's even a little bit kind of retro I mean it's very 1960s but it throws back to kind of earlier female costume designs and although this obviously comes nearly 20 years before it reminds me a lot of Silk Spectre's costume from Watchmen the original Silk Spectre not the dog or not the one who's the primary character, but the, the secondary character to the story had a costume that had the same silhouette to it. So as the Avengers wrap up the installation of their new equipment, the last thing for them to do is to inform their faithful butler Jarvis of all of the changes they've made to the building so that Jarvis doesn't inadvertently catch himself in a trap. And this is kind of fun because this issue in particular is the first time we really see Jarvis get some actual personality. In this particular issue, it's a little dark, it's kind of sinister, but all the same, it's better than having a named character that just kind of exists in the background with no personality and nothing to draw you to them. This really 
helps to flesh out the Avengers universe by giving the world people other than the Avengers. Or in, in reality, the Marvel Universe, people other than superheroes. Now, as Goliath explains what's going on to Jarvis, he makes a little bit of a joke about don't go telling people about these new improvements we've made. And he actually specifically calls out the Daily Bugle, which I always love because it gives a nice sense of a shared universe. Because again, that's the paper that Peter Parker works for, off and on as a freelance photographer, and is run by the spectacular done J. Jonah Jameson, who is just one of those characters that is so, so entertaining to read and watch on screen. But as Goliath makes this comment to Jarvis, Jarvis gets kind of defensive and asks, you know, sir, do you question my loyalty after all these years? And it starts to get you thinking, like, that's a really interesting thing for Jarvis to, to say. If he's been around the Avengers for a couple of years, you know, he should be prepared for some jokes like this. Goliath doesn't necessarily make very good jokes, but he does make jokes from time to time. So this should not be very surprising. And it's a little interesting that Jarvis gets so defensive. But as we see, there's something going on with Jarvis. After he leaves the room, he kind of sneaks away and makes a phone call saying that he has the information and he'll be there soon, which is obviously a very sinister way to start off here. Seeing as the Avengers have finished their work for the day, Wasp has decided to go out by putting on the most ridiculous looking outfit possible. And as she's leaving, she asks Jarvis if he's running on an errand. And Jarvis reminds Wasp that it is his day off and that he has to go take care of something. And as the conversation turns, we find out that Wasp is waiting for her chauffeur, Charles, and that she really wants to go for a drive. But seeing as Jarvis is on his way out, the two of them d decide to go for a walk and make it part of the way through Midtown Manhattan before parting ways. Now, Jarvis tells Wasp that he is going north to the Bronx in order to visit his mother. But instead, Jarvis quickly heads to a subway station going the other direction, going downtown, and heads south towards what we see is really kind of a abandoned or run-down building. Now, on this page, I really like a couple of things. First off is Jarvis's look. He's got a very Dick Tracy look to him. I don't know if it's an intentional thing or not, but given the color palette they're, they're using here, it makes him blend in and at the same time stand out. I know who Jarvis is because he's wearing the yellow hat and coat, but in the blues and purples and browns that they're using, Jarvis doesn't look like someone out of the ordinary he blends in with the crowd in a way that someone in like a superhero costume wouldn't and it makes it easy for the reader to continue to follow the character throughout the couple of panels we're looking at here so the second thing that really draws me to this is specifically the subway panel so again i lived in new york city for about four and a half years and i have ridden on my fair share of subways and i I know the exact subway car Jarvis is on. I mean, not like the this specific serial numbered car, but anyone who's ridden the subway for even a short period of time really knows what that car is like. That car that is packed with people on top of each other, crammed in next to each other. We've all been there. And I love the fact that John Buscema draws this because it's a very realistic, actual portrayal of New York that helps put you in the right location, the right mindset. Finally, I absolutely love the fact that as we're going, we get these thought bubbles from Jarvis that gives him so much more color and character and depth. He talks about where he grew up as, as we see him walking through this ramshackle neighborhood, that he grew up in a place just like this, and that the baseball score scribbled on a wall could just have easily easily have been his, he and his friends as opposed to whatever kids left it. And then you know, we find Jarvis going through these old buildings and it's an interesting mental disconnect because you see Jarvis who's in this butler's uniform, very well dressed, very well groomed, walking through this absolute slum, knowing that at one point in time he fit in perfectly here, but he really doesn't anywhere near as much anymore. So as Jarvis makes his way into an abandoned building and then into the basement of this building, he eventually enters a, a room where he is introduced to the new master. Masters of Evil. And the new Masters of Evil in this case are made up of Claw, Whirlwind, Melter, Black Knight, and Radioactive Man. Now to be clear, only two of these are technically original members because the Black Knight we see here is actually a different Black Knight. It's the one we've seen in the last several issues. It is Dane Whitman as opposed to Nathan Garrett, Dane's uncle, who was the original Black Knight and founding member of the Masters of Evil. This is also the first time we are seeing the Masters of Evil having been formed since the death of Baron Zemo. Since the death of Baron Zemo. 
Now, of course, a group of, I would call them B-list villains, would not have just gotten themselves together like this without someone pulling the strings. And so behind them and the person who introduced them, we see the Crimson Cowl, which is a really cool looking villain in what is obviously supposed to be crimson. In my printing, it looks uh, a lot more fuchsia, to be perfectly honest, but it is a, a robed and cowled and covered figure and all you can see is a pair of glowing eyes and he is the one pulling the strings and has assembled the masters of evil as we come to find out crimson cowl is the individual that jarvis spoke to on the phone and that he has come to give the cowl this information that he, he mentioned before and receive his payment and then you get the impression that the masters of evil didn't actually expect him here at this point in time radioactive man actually refers to Jarvis is coming out of left field and that he suspects it's a trap. Of course, Jarvis defends it saying this isn't a trap. I really need this money for something. That's why I'm doing this. And then Claw starts to kind of rant and rave that if the Masters of Evil don't start taking action, then he's going to go get revenge himself. And we see a flashback to Fantastic 453 and the first interactions between Claw and, at that point, T'Challa, not necessarily in his Black Panther persona, where Black Panther caused the gun in Claw's hand to explode, which therefore damaged his hand, and then... Flash forwarding into the future, we see Claw facing off against Black Panther again. However, at the end, after he's been defeated, Claw throws himself into the Sound Transformer and gains this incredible power and is now a being of solidified sound, which, again, is absolute nonsensical garbage in terms of science, but... It does sound kind of cool. Solidified sound. He's just he's pure sound. It's an odd power combination for a character with the name of Claw, but weird things happen in comics in the 60s. I mean, that's that's really all I've got. And to be fair, the mini Claw origin story isn't bad. Uh, I've never read these issues of Fantastic Four, so the references to them are kind of helpful, and it gives me a quick understanding of why Claw looks the way he does, because he looks really kind of weird, especially compared to what I would expect, and quite honestly, what we just saw in the release of the Black Panther film. So from there, however, we get a little bit of a origin story for Radioactive Man, and I don't know why, because we've done this already in Avengers, plus in the original story. I still don't understand why Mjolnir just bounces off of Radioactive Man. Like, that's still kind of a weird thing to me. Me, but we'll just have to kind of accept it as is. And then we get a quick recap of the events of Avengers number six, specifically with regards to Iron Man and Radioactive Man, which again, unnecessary and also a little bit weird that we get Claw and Radioactive Man, but not Melter. I don't really think we need Black Knight or Whirlwind because both of them have been recent Avengers villains with backstories involved in their issues, but we haven't seen Melter or Radioactive Man for a while. And to only get one and not the other just confuses me a little bit. But at any rate, so after Radioactive Man finishes this little flashback, Radioactive Man and the rest of the Masters of Evil start pressuring Crimson Cowl to explain his plan to the Masters of Evil, at which point we find out that Jarvis has delivered a copy of the floor plans to Avengers Mansion, including the new security devices, to the Masters of Evil. So it appears that Jarvis has betrayed his employers, has betrayed the Avengers. And as Jarvis comes to collect his payment, the Crimson Cowl changes his mind on the deal and instead shoots Jarvis with a gas pellet so that they can go deal with the Avengers and come back and deal with Jarvis later. And so the Masters of Evil head off towards Avengers Mansion. Now, again, keep in mind that Black Knight is not the same Black Knight as was originally a member of the Masters of Evil. And because of this, Dane Whitman wants to help the Avengers. So he gets on his Pegasus and flies towards Avengers Mansion. And while he does, we get a mini flashback, not so much to Black Knight's origin, but to how he got in contact with the Masters of Evil. And in this case, Dane Whitman receives a letter from the Crimson Cowl inviting him 
or rather inviting his uncle to join the Masters of Evil. Since Dane Whitman has taken up the mantle of Black Knight, he decides to look into this, shows up, and introduces himself to Crimson Cal, who comments that he's a bit younger than would have been expected. There's a great little banter between the two of them for a moment, and Crimson Cal accepts Black Knight into the Masters of Evil. At which point we jump back to our current story, and as Black Knight lands on the rooftop, the other Masters of Evil are waiting for him, knowing full well that Black Knight does in fact intend to betray the Masters of Evil to the Avengers, and to warn the Avengers. So I've got to give Black Knight a lot of props here, because... Instead of giving in or trying to make a quick break for it, Black Knight attempts to stay and fight, even though he's outnumbered, and really didn't have a chance. You know, the other Masters of Evil have him outnumbered 4-1, to one, and Black Knight really doesn't have any powers compared to the other four Masters of Evil who have at least reasonably strong powers. So they manage to beat down Black Knight pretty significantly, although Black Knight's Pegasus does get a pretty good shot in on Radioactive Man. Now, because the Avengers frequently have their command center manned on a, a kind of watch rotation, we see Hawkeye monitoring what's going on outside the mansion, sees the Black Knight's Pegasus, and realizes that mm, they should probably do something. Because again, at this point, they don't know that Black Knight is on their side. Although they've had interactions with him that have been positive, he's not necessarily a hero. So Hawkeye decides that the smartest thing to do is to do an Avengers Assemble and get everyone together to combat what he expects is coming. Unfortunately, just as he's getting ready to do so, the Melter blasts his way into the command center, and the two quickly square off against one another in some really great action. I especially like the panel with Hawkeye firing the arrow at Melter while simultaneously dodging one of Melter's shots. I think it's a great panel that conveys the intended sense of action and really just adds a, a sense of pacing and action to this sequence. Now, unfortunately, when Hawkeye's arrow strikes Melter, Melter's weapon goes off, hits some equipment above Hawkeye, which comes crashing down on him, and so Hawkeye is taken out of the fight. Next, we find Black Panther in the garage, looking like he's getting ready to go out for a drive. He's actually climbing into the car as we see Whirlwind come through one of the air ducts at him. And there's an interesting conversation between Whirlwind and Black Panther, in which Black Panther says he doesn't recognize the mask. He says, but the tone is familiar. And that Whirlwind then says, you pick up on American vernacular quickly. And I'm kind of wondering what the implication here is. Are they implying that Black Panther has come to understand that Whirlwind is threatening, i.e. using a threatening tone of voice? Or is Black Panther actually recognizing Whirlwind's voice? Because again, remember, Whirlwind is Wasp's chauffeur. And although we haven't seen any direct interaction between the two, it is very plausible that in his time at Avengers Mansion, Black Panther has come to meet and maybe interact with, on a, on a limited basis, Wasp's chauffeur. So the tone of voice is familiar because he's heard or spoke to this man before. I'm not sure which is implied. I like to think that it's the second one. He recognizes the voice, but we shall have to wait and see. And again, either one certainly works for the situation. So while Black Panther gets a early leg up on Whirlwind, when Whirlwind begins to use his powers, unfortunately Black Panther and most everything else in the garage is flung around in a tornado-like manner, and Black Panther is taken out of the fight. Next, we find Wasp in her room, looking as though she is getting ready to go out or something. She has what appears to be a, a makeup, a puff ball. I don't know, makeup tools, but something to apply makeup. And literally, the wall of her bedroom just kind of explodes. And Wasp is somewhat unperturbed by this. It's kind of interesting. She says, that sounds like a thousand shrill sirens. And something just tore a gaping hole in my wall. To be fair, if you're living in Avengers Mansion, that might actually be a fairly uncommon occurrence. But in this case, Wasp is now facing off against Claw. And the first thing that Wasp does is she hurls a bunch of her makeup and her table at Claw, throwing him off balance. And then she shrinks down to Wasp size in an attempt to escape. Unfortunately, just as she's about to get to the door, Claw uses his sonic beams to slam the door shut and Wasp plows straight into it, knocking herself unconscious. And then finally, we have 
Goliath and Radioactive Man facing off against one another. But most importantly, we have more Bill Foster. Not only that, Bill Foster, this guy has got some balls of steel here, folks. Bill Foster charges headlong at a radioactive villain completely unarmed in order to protect Goliath. So let's just think about this for one second. Radioactive Man is literally radioactive. And the closer you get to him, the more radiation exposure you get. For those of you who don't know, radiation exposure, not a good way to die. Bill Foster, completely unarmed. Goliath, superpower. Bill Foster charges headlong at Radioactive Man in an attempt to protect Goliath. Every time we see Bill Foster, he just grows on me more and more. He was a character that was really great to introduce to the book. I'm glad he's here. I'm looking forward to the day where he becomes a superhero himself. He's got the hero thing down pretty well already. Needless to say, Bill unfortunately doesn't get very far before Radioactive Man stops him with an Adhesive X foam so that he can't move. And remember, Adhesive X is the super, super powerful adhesive glue that Baron Zemo invented and stuck the mask to Baron Zemo's face. So of course now Goliath is going to get involved and Goliath is even more upset now because his friend has been stopped in such a manner. So Goliath puts on what amount to oven mitts and then begins to fight against Radioactive Man. Now there's a great Radioactive Man panel here in the middle where we see half of Radioactive Man face in shadow with the white eyes and then the good old nuclear radioactive glow green color that he is. It's reminiscent of a couple panels that we've seen with Hulk much earlier in Avengers, but this is, it's a very cool, very well done panel. And I love the shadowing, especially with the white eyes. There's something about it with just the black, the green, and the white eyes that really does it for me. And the fight actually seems to be going in Goliath's favor for most of the time until Goliath sees Radioactive Man pass through a dark light trap and then not get caught. At which point, Goliath goes to pass through the same trap and is in fact caught and Radioactive Man hoses him down with the adhesive X foam. So now at this point, all of the Avengers have been captured. And this is actually where we see Wasp in the little jar. It kind of actually looks like a salt shaker that Claw has put her in, which it, it may very well be. So with all of the Avengers captured, the Masters of Evil take this opportunity to contact their boss, the Crimson Cowl. And the Masters of Evil begin to demand to know more about Crimson Cowl. They basically basically say, hey, we accomplished the mission you asked us to, so, you know, we deserve to know who you are. And as the Crimson Cowl is speaking to the Avengers, basically saying, I don't care what you want. You don't have the right to know who I am. You know, you're just my minions. We see a hand coming towards the Crimson Cowl, and the hand grabs the hood and Cowl throws it back to reveal the face of a robot. The Crimson Cowl continues talking, saying that the Avengers deserve to know who engineered their defeat, though. And this second Crimson Cowl figure then reveals himself to be none other than Jarvis. And this is such a cool ending reveal. One, the art in this panel is great. I mean, there's a lot of fuchsia, don't get me wrong. It's a little intense to look at, especially with the, like, kind of 70s puke green carpet color in the background. But take a look at Jarvis's face. It's twisted in such an evil, wrathful, and contemptible manner. It sells me perfectly on this. Now again, I know what's going to happen. Obviously, one, because I've read the next issue, and two, because I've got 50 years of Avengers stories after this that give me a pretty good idea of what's actually going on. But at the end of this issue, just think about the sell and the reveal of Jarvis being this mastermind villain, having fooled the Masters of Evil, having fooled the Avengers, and, and you can't help but think, oh my god, like, where are they going with this? Like, is this going to be the new crazy villain for the Avengers? Is, is this going to be their version of Doctor Doom? Oh, there's just so many cool things that, that, that could happen. So, the last thing worth covering is that, yes, this is technically the first appearance of Ultron. In the second to last panel, where the Crimson Cowl reveals the robot, the robot is in fact Ultron. It is a thoroughly anticlimactic initial reveal, especially for a character that we know will become one of the Avengers' greatest villains. However, having said that, for all the audience at the time knew, this robot could have been a complete throwaway. Rather anticlimactic, though we will get plenty more Ultron in the next issue. So overall, I think this is a pretty strong issue. I love the extra character depth we get from Jarvis. I love 
a lot of the art, there's some very cool panels going on, especially with characters in shadow or like when Black Knight is flying to go see the Avengers with a with a dark sky behind him. A lot of really interesting, really kind of cool things going on. And again, this introduces one of my favorite Avengers villains and one of the real classics, Ultron. I, I think I like Kang a little bit better, but that's just, you know, that's me. But we had Avengers Age of Ultron as a movie for crying out loud. Doesn't get much bigger than that. So I'm excited for next week. I'm excited for the next issue. And I'm excited now that we have Ultron as part of our rogues gallery, part of our cast of characters, that he can keep coming back and causing us mayhem. Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, send your questions and comments to Andrew at AvengersAssembly.com. Next week, we are taking a look at Avengers number 55, Mayhem Over Manhattan. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, Let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it.